Welcome to Access to Perspectives Conversations, the podcast for bridging academic landscapes. At Access to Perspectives, we provide novel insights into the communication and management of research. Our goal is to equip researchers around the world with the skills and enthusiasm they need to pursue a successful career. You will get insights around the topics of scholarly reading, writing and publishing, career development, project management and research integrity, all embedded into open science practices. Learn more about our work at accesstoperspectives.org. Right. Very happy to have another episode of Access to Perspectives Conversations presenting to you, and even more happy to be reconnecting with Cooper Smart. Thanks for joining today, Cooper. Thanks, Joe. It's great to see you. It's been a while. <laughs> it's been quite a while. I, let's not count the years, but we've met many moons ago, um, as we've both been involved in open science, early days of open science movement, if we want to use that phrase, before it became the institutionalized, um, multi, le yeah, like multi-level, also policy-driven, thankfully, but also well, thankfully, policy driven by now. But <clears throat> so now it's very much more formalized. And um, we met in an era which is actually not too long ago. Let's not overstress the fact that it's been a few years, not not too many. Um, I think around 2015, 16, around that time. Um, that was probably yeah when I was starting to get into open science. That was the year I started my PhD. Um, oh. And I think I really... Yeah, didn't really dive deep into the world of open science until I tried to publish my first paper and realized uh, 17, what a mess 16, 17, it was. something must have been. Anyways, um, and you at the time were running free our knowledge, but also yes. as we usually start with the sessions, um, we can start there or you just give us a little bit of a background about yourself and how you found yourself in the in the crazy world of open science. <laughs> <laughs> the lovely world. Um, yeah, a bit of background is always good, I think. Um, I'll take you back to my first degree, which was architecture. Um, and that was straight out of school. And I really didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. And I quickly realized that buildings weren't for me, but I did love design. So yeah, I traveled around the world trying to find my place in it. And that brought me to a meditation retreat in Thailand. And it was a 10 day Vipassana retreat and that blew my mind in more mm -hmm. ways than one. <laughs> um, and I realized that, or I felt that um, meditation and mindfulness could be a really powerful medicine for the West. So I embarked on this journey to try and understand consciousness from all angles. And, and that took me to study psychology at UQ, uh, that's University of Queensland in Australia. Mm -hmm. um, and then during my honours year, I found that I really loved research. And so I um, joined with a cognitive neuroscience lab, a really great lab in at the Queensland Brain Institute. And yes, set out on a PhD intending to become a meditation researcher. Um, okay, and and I, let's just pause there. I didn't even know that existed. But, it, but <laughs> doing research on meditation... I think, well, I actually got to know about researchers on, re well, researchers specializing on yoga and not mm -hmm. just what in the West we're most familiar with the actual body work yoga, but there's a whole mm -hmm. big ecosystem and knowledge system behind. And most of it is actually about theories on worldviews and, and, and one component of, I think, four or five main major pillars. Uh, is concerned with the actual physical exercises with, that we are aware of. So what, but meditation, okay, what aspects of meditation did you attempt to research or actually do research on? Like how um, can you well, in my, meditation? Um, in my PhD, it was, that there wasn't really the level of expertise around for me to um, embark on meditation research. So what I decided to do was, um, focus on what I thought were the fundamental mechanisms. So my PhD was on attention. I was primarily mm -hmm. in an attention lab, so that made sense. Um, but I also started looking into and researching predictive coding theory um, on the premise that these two processes, attention and prediction, 
are fundamental in the brain and um, are largely responsible for the way we perceive the world. And so I figured that they had to play some kind of a fundamental role in in meditative states and other changes of consciousness. Um, and there was, yeah, some really interesting theories coming out around that time around what consciousness might be and how it might relate to these processes. And so that's what I did my PhD on is basically yeah. um, very well, narrowing down the, the definition of consciousness to a point of um, something that you could experiment on <laughs> uh, and then looking at what happens in the brain when these when you manipulate these processes. It's interesting because um, when it comes to consciousness and I'm an uh, animal, should I say lover? Like I'm a rights advocate, also aiming to do more of that through access to perspectives by looking into um, how can we improve animal welfare as as mm. societies on this world, but also for research animals or animals used in research um, contexts. But um, I'm mentioning that because when I was around 12, 13, 14 years old, I read a book on, like it was in German, so I'm translating here, to so do animals have a consciousness? And apparently researchers questioned that or denied that for the longest time, and some researchers would still argue against. But then um, <clears throat> a veterinarian and a behavioralist, animal behavior, like it, knowledge, it, I can never pronounce it. Ethology, <laughs> ethologists, um, argued very much. Well, they they had interesting attempts and in kind of questioning it by the way they described it, but then made a point and but that's actual conscious behavior. So obviously, even bees have a level of consciousness. And what is it even? So yeah. So and the what is consciousness is like highly disputed in the psychology world or hum humanist, uh, yeah, research arenas. But yeah, I mean that alone is is a topic to delve into for hours. But let's come back to now to your career with open science. So as much as that is exciting already, what what troubled you in your research experience that brought you into open science? Um, yeah, well, it was really um, publishing my first paper, which was. Uh an extension and really an improvement of my honors work, which was um, like award-winning work. So I felt like it was worthy of being out there and, and a story worthy of being told. Um, and when I tried to publish that paper, it took four journals and over the span of two years and multiple rounds of review and myself and my supervisor had to rewrite the paper multiple times. And the whole process just seemed like a ridiculous waste of time um, for everybody involved. And on top of that, all of the reviews and all that information wasn't being published. And I was just really baffled that um, uh, the academic system was so inefficient. And, you know, coming from my undergrad days, I just thought it would function well and it would be optimized to seek truth. And I found it was actually the opposite in many ways and it was antagonistic to doing good science. And so, that was like a watershed moment for me. And I I basically did a deep dive and for the rest of my PhD started moving into the open science and meta science space. Um, and yeah, as as you know, and I'm sure a lot of the readers know that I, I learned that the academic system has been co-opted by publishers and it's really much more of a business than um, the truth finding mission that it should be. Um, and yeah, found this really beautiful pocket of um, open science that I hadn't heard of before. And I had started designing, you know, as a former designer, I'd started thinking about how I would design the system from scratch if I could. Mm. Um, and then I was really happy and excited to find that already there were models that had been published along the lines of what I was thinking. And there were already journals out there that were um, transparent and community owned and you know, exploring some of these ideas. And mm -hmm. so that was really encouraging. But then the baffling moment for me was realizing that no one was using these journals and everyone was still using these expensive, closed, inefficient, um, traditional journals. Um, and so, yeah, that kind of... I use the word traditional because that concept is really just a couple of decades old, whereas academia as such or scholarship is like... 
you know, much older. And then knowledge systems beyond the Western or academic one we, we talk about are as old as human existence. But so the word traditional always disturbs me, like traditional publishing, was it what is that even? And why do yeah. you refer to the the few but predominant ones that are actually harming the scholarly community? Um Yeah, I never know what to call them. I, so. I, I never I never know what to call them. I don't I don't wanna um <laughs> term them something like soul scabbing journals, but um parasitical journal journals um <laughs> it's all kinds of words we could use uh i guess like high impact is is a word that's often used but high impact itself is not necessarily a, a problem it's you know it's the business model within something being high impact that is the problem um yeah so yeah i, I never know the term to use but i guess privately owned you know profit driven journals yeah, yes. I think the profit driven because talking to editors or people who work for certain or the those usual suspects or five or seven or nine, depending mm -hmm. on who you count into this. Mm -hmm. Um yeah. The the sort of publishing houses. Um they they would always argue, well, we're also we we're actually serving um the community, but then I think it's yeah, over the years I've learned that it's it's just a screwed system due to the lack of commitment by other stakeholders, including funders, including institutions, governments to chip in for what the actual costs are. So those few had an opportunity and a, kind of a, a gap in the market to fill. And now we we have other opportunities, but they are under under resourced and under underused, as you pointed out. So yeah. and I think yeah. you can add another stakeholder in there in the researchers themselves because we are all you know part of the problem slash solution mm -hmm. um and as much as we can point at stakeholders it's also up to us to be the change and and that is the premise behind the open science movement but yeah I guess I I was trying to understand why most people weren't already using these platforms and and come from a perspective what can I do as an individual to try and create change mm. um and when I, the weird thing is when you talk to everyone everyone knows that the game is broken you know and everyone knows that it's corrupt and that these journals aren't in our best interests but um that everyone's also trapped by the same game that we're playing we keep playing this impact game because that's what our salaries depend on and it's what we've trained most of our lives to become mm. and and there's very little option for the average researcher to sort of step outside the mold and and not play that game because that's how they're being rewarded, as you say, by the institutions mm. and as the by the funders. And so it's this ridiculously interconnected web of incentives that keeps people trapped mm. into playing this game. Yeah, and that seems to be the hardest thing to change. But there's several institutions now, thankfully. So now mm. we're an institution now we're trying to change the paradigm. So we we're pushing on all ends of the circle. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So it's really like a squaring the circle exercise. But many people are pushing the circle into the square shape, or vice versa. But um, <laughs> I want to refer back to your med meditation and um, meditation background because that's interesting. With access to perspectives, there's also kind of included um, well-being of any sort into the portfolio because I think that's key and is also a cornerstone of open science, reminding us of our core human values and principles, mm -hmm. which ensure physical and mental well-being to start with and now in a professional environment um and that's what the open science um principles reminds uh, remind us of things like transparency accountability uh colleagueship and these are things anyone can easily subscribe to and are also written up in several um what's it called uh what's the acronym now um, scientific best practices and different mm. versions there's that or research best practices or yeah um so it's nothing new but what what we are well aware of and what you just described like the publishing incentives and just a few overpriced journals 
to either force the public or the readers to pay. And that was the paywall era. And that's where we started off with the movement, which had started way before also with open access initiatives, Budapest um, initiative and others. But in <clears throat> around 2014 and, and counting until today, we've had a new wave of enthusiasm and advocacy, which now thankfully led also to the UNESCO Open Science Recommendations postulated just um, two years ago now. And um, we're like many are also working towards implementation. What I want to say is, what's your experience and observation of um, well-being through your lens of having a meditation focus background? Mm. And then in your experience and activism as an open science advocate for science. Did that sentence um, make sense? I think it became quite a long one. <laughs> <laughs> no, I understand where you're going with it. Oh, okay. um, yeah, I I have a very personal experience with mental well-being. Um, my PhD um, drove me to a, a breakdown, really, um, where I burned out. And it was a particular interaction between my perfectionism and the high standards that are placed on PhD students and academics in general. And the, you know, as I saw it, the narrowing pipeline of me getting a job and then getting a professorship, you know, working towards where I wanted to be in academia seemed like an impossible task. And so I placed all this pressure on myself in my PhD and ended up burning out, um, as so many people do in this high pressure system, system that mm. we've created. Um, and yeah, like I would say that meditation really was my savior because it was a core strength that I could fall back on and, um, use to rebuild my mind really from the ground up. And, um, uh, I, I know this isn't an uncommon story. Like we have f rates of 40% of PhD students, um, have depression or anxiety. And I think that extends to the general academic population as well. So we have a highly you know, stressed, mentally unwell population of people that are feeling that they need to overwork to outcompete everyone else when the reality is science should be a collaborative process where we're working together and yeah. we should be well, that, recognized yeah. and rewarded for collaborating. But um, it's an impossible line to walk as an academic with what academia says it is and then what we find out it actually Turns out to be. Yeah, it it um, funnels us into this path, and it's also it's a nature of the structure, you know, like the way that grants are awarded in a competitive system. It creates this um, tension even between coworkers because, in many ways, your coworkers are your competitors for for the same grants, and because you're not being rewarded and recognized properly for collaborative pursuits, which are the most generative and they are the most creative. Um, people are placed into this sort of like silo of activity and feel that they need to, yeah, I guess, hold on to their secrets in many ways and, you know, go it alone. And it's not good for anyone's mental health or well-being. Like mm -hmm. we really should be working together and collaborating and yeah, to, to come back to your point, like I, I think that that is a really beautiful feature of open science is that the openness naturally creates collaboration and it naturally um, fosters um, people working together and, and a, a healthier mindset and, a, and also a healthier workplace because you then are drawn to collaborate with people and um, it's much more expansive instead of, I guess, restrictive of the current mm. model. Yeah, what I was from back to earlier was good scientific practice known as GSP was the acronym I was struggling to find but yeah so the um but and I think like just to to come back to that once more is like that environment which we assume only exists in the corporate world to find that in academia where everything should oh. be collaborative also to find solutions to the challenges not only for applied research, but much of the basic research also has an intention and purpose in mind to start from or to eventually mm -hmm. lead towards. Like in my case, I was studying um, 
biodiversity in the broader sense and evolution. So basically deciphering on a molecular level the animatry of life in, in one of its branches for arthropods. And what I figured um, it could lead to is by us knowing better how diversity evolved, we can also better protect and well learn about each species and their place in the ecosystem and therefore have more reasons to protect them. Um, <clears throat> so in any basic research there's that. So, but what I, where I was going is, it's actually against human intention to have a competitive working environment in that regard. And even in the corporate yeah. world, it's not healthy. I see how people burn out um, regularly. And what you described for yourself and colleagues and with the statistics, I find myself also in, as I also shared on the uh, previous episodes. And therefore, that's that's the very reason why I think like talking about our well-being in relation to the scientific and academic working environment and regular practices is important not on, so that we can structure the day and the week and the year in such a way that we don't exhaust ourselves, but also find ways to collaborate and to share the results so that we can actually feel proud of the work we do every day. And that's the mantra of open science principles, but also of good scientific practice ever since. So it seems like we are really learning how to do science the right way. Um, because it has come under pressure quite recently, oh. well, relatively recently speaking. Yeah, absolutely. Open science is just good science. <laughs> yeah, in, yeah, exactly. In my opinion, yeah. it's yeah, and it's strange that you know we've we've through this privatized journal model over the last fifty to sixty years have switched from being a what was originally a really collaborative open process where. Um, you know, you could just publish your findings and it didn't matter if it was a negative result or a null result. We've, mm -hmm. we've switched to this, this absurd model where you, you can only really publish if it's significant and it's sexy and it's new and it's novel and it's written in a particular way. So yeah. well, yeah, open science isn't people it? expect from research to be thorough and painfully detailed <laughs> just to give us proof of concept. But if we always strive for innovation and and super su what's the superlatives of any kind, we we well, obviously lose grasp of of that accuracy. Yeah, and it takes us back to that key word that's always talked about in in you know the credibility re revolution, which is incentives. You know, mm -hmm. Like, how are we incentivizing people to do good science as opposed to, mm. um, yeah, telling a particular story or or chasing significant results just so they can get published. So what was your approach then with free hour knowledge? And like how, free, how, were, how were the free, early days? Like how did you get the, the initiative started? Um, yeah, free knowledge was two halves of a coin in my mind. Um, the way I saw culture change back then was that you need good technology. And, and I'll say from the outset that I was interested in disruption. So I was interested in overthrowing this broken journal model and, and switching to a you know, fully open science model. And so I saw that you either need, well, you need two things, good technology and you need a cultural shift. And when I looked around, I felt like that we already had the technology that we needed. We had all these diamond or platinum open access journals that weren't being utilized. Um, and we had, you know, some of those journals exploring with quantitative measures and and interesting things like that. So I felt that my time was best spent on the other side of the coin, trying to look at cultural change. And the way I saw it, I think a bit simplistically at the beginning was that, you know, there's all this value being poured into journals uh, and the researchers through their publications and their reviews are continually propping up these high impact journals. Um, and so if those same researchers were to just collectively decide to shift their energy into the new systems, then they could sort of bootstrap the value, bootstrap the prestige of those new journals and mm -hmm. create that incentive structure just by that collective shift. And, and so that idea is, it's not really new. It's called a conditional pledge. Like the idea that you would sign uh, a pledge that says I'm willing to go exclusively open access when X 
you know percentage of my pop of my community do or you know ex researchers or however many people you wanted to define and so yeah, and that, that provides that was a like safe that... space right because some researchers express concerns that moving to an open access journals with a lower impact journal impact factor might they might risk their careers but if a critical no a threshold number of researchers from that very same discipline would do the same then they wouldn't be as 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 yeah as what's the word um, exposed exposed to oh that. yeah <laughs> yeah i think that's the idea it's like you know the herd moves together you don't mm -hmm. um but the person that leaves the herd is is a target and, and it's very much what it feels like in the current um, paradigm is that if you don't yeah. follow along then you're at risk of not getting that next job or you know um mm -hmm. that there's so much institutional pressure to to not act I've, in that way i've actually so, i've i've seen pledges for that and the court i think also mostly to through your work for your knowledge but ha has it happened in several instances uh like have you with for knowledge and others been able to mobilize communities of researchers to switch well i think this was a big learning for me and the biggest learning over the course of the probably three years that i poured my energy into free knowledge um is that there's academia is still so risk averse that there's there's a, a lot of resistance even to signing a pledge mm. to act where in the future when you've got the support of your community like even that idea which is from my perspective like low bar like there's really no risk because you can wait until you've got mm. 20 percent of your field or you know 10 000 researchers alongside with you and at that point like that would be such a significant statement that it would you know kick start the reputation of these new journals and from my perspective that's really minimal or negligible risk but there's still a kind of resistance i think in academia to even take that kind of a, a mm -hmm. step um and yeah like what i would say is that we we explored a number of um campaigns and the the platform evolved from this sort of mm -hmm. open access focus in the early days to being a general platform for open and research reproducible practices so we've hosted um campaigns for pre-registration um mm -hmm. for open access, like I said, um, open code and whatnot. Um, and yeah, like I, I'm, I think personally, I wasn't seeing the the rate of uptake that I wanted to see, because as I said, I want, I'm interested in dis disruption and I, I could definitely see how I can see how that model is useful and it's sure. um, still valuable in the space, but it's also a relatively slow burn. You know, it's going to take years for that kind of uh, a model to gain the degree of um, recognition that, that it needs and then probably decades before it's actually shifting academia mm. um, and so probably the biggest learning I had through that project aside from all the personal growth and it, it was also a big factor in my recovery from you know, mental unhealth because it was the shining light that I was heading towards and mm. and it was connecting me with amazing humans like yourself around the world that are championing open science and really believe in this open future as I did. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I got, a, I got a lot out of that process, but I, I reached the conclusion eventually that my assumption in the beginning was wrong. I, I didn't think anymore that we did have the right technology, that we had the, you know, breakthrough technology that was an order or orders of magnitude better than the current journals. Um, and so I, I started to gradually shift my attention back to designing what, what the optimal system would be and, and working on that problem in mm. parallel um, to free our knowledge. And, and I'll be honest, like the last two years, I kind of, I dropped the ball on, on free our knowledge because I got a bit too obsessed with, with the new direction I was heading. Um, but I also didn't feel like it had run its course and I didn't want to um, just sort of close the project um, and so happily last year, I, I received some emails from two separate groups of researchers that were interested in this idea and wanted to pursue collective action. And so we've now handed over the, the project to a new board that are um, hosting a new campaign. And that campaign is oh. much simpler and it's um, 
based on a lot of the learnings that have come out of Free Our Knowledge, which is keep things mm -hmm. simple as low bar as possible. Um, and it's basically, you know, it's the, as simple as it gets now. So it's basically one person can pledge to publish in one platinum open access journal in the next five years. And the idea is like we start super simple, super low bar, mm. um, get broad traction with that really simple campaign, and then we can still build on that and and move the community through increasing levels of you know open science ness as we go on. <laughs> Nice. So it's still the same network, uh, same website, right? Freeourknowledge.org. Or... Yes, it is. Yeah. Okay, cool. So we'll link that for sure in the show notes so people can access and pledge with people, <laughs> make your commitments. Um, even message like, can, is there also a place, or this might be another facilitator, or, um, to have a place where people who already made the commitment to showcase, like, hey, I've already published, I don't know, five papers by now in like Diamond Open Access Journals, ABC. Like to lead by example kind of thing. Um, just a wild idea. Yeah we, <laughs> yeah, we have a, I mean, we have a Slack space that's primarily just being used by the organizing team right now. Um, I mean, I always, I always found that Twitter and those sort of, you know, socials platforms were a good place to to advertise and try and let people know about what you're doing in the space mm -hmm. um we had dreams of um yeah building a, a bigger forum and um having that sort of discussion space going yeah. as well um but it's or yeah, i think it, it this could also be a buddy system like for people to join the slack channel for your knowledge um on slack um, even so just to have a call out for people who are already happily pu publishing um, green diamond open access versions of their research accomplishments um, to to buddy up and mentor those who are still at the fence and and trying to find the gateway to, or mm. to get towards um, and are uh, seeing obstacles in the way to help remove those I think can also so joining the community you don't have to be a like like a person who has not yet published open access, right? You can help uh raise awareness and and um bring people to the party. Yeah, there are there are also like uh, we we didn't go down that direction too much because there's awesome organizations like as you know, like Center mm -hmm. for Open Science that that host webinars on this stuff and ASAP Bio who who are big on the preprint space and mm -hmm. you know will um, host regular webinars where people can talk about issues and um, concerns or help help people through yeah. the process. Um, I guess I did, you know, in the, in the big dreaming phase of the project, expect that or hope that we would go that direction. Um, but I, yeah, like I said, my my I I pivoted at one point. Um, yeah, no, of course yeah. not. I don't wanna. Um, it's not. I'm not trying to say what you could have done or what the new team now could engage in. And just trying to say, okay, whoever finds this interesting, check it out and and see how what else you can learn about open science because there's many resources listed still on the website and it's like it's just a beautiful initiative to get started and to 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 make that pledge and to encourage others again, like to yeah to spread the word also about free our knowledge. Um. So what's Keep, what kept you busy over the last two years then? Uh, oh, the years. last two years have been even more of a wild ride than <laughs> my academic journey. Um, so yeah, like like I said, I, I kept designing what I thought would be a useful model. And I was, I was nearing the point of a model that I thought could help disrupt the journal industry. And in effect, it's it's based on an open evaluation model and it is quantitative. So it's based on this model that there's various versions published in the literature where anyone in the community could rate uh, and review any contribution. So any paper on a number of dimensions and, and in doing so it creates this you know, multi-dimensional matrix that, that represents the diverse qualities of different contributions. Uh, and my idea was that if we had such a matrix, we could train AI or we could use those matrix that matrix to filter information, filter contributions to find the most high quality 
contributions. So we could really pick out the cream from the crop. Mm -hmm. And if we did that, then we could create a, a new set of journals that were kind of hierarchically based and it could be um, sort of tiered in a way that those top tier journals within this family of journals um, would generate prestige because it would be based on the transparent ratings of the community. We mm -hmm. could then optimize to select for the best quality content in different, you know, um, dimensions of interest. So replicability, transparency, you know, all of the things that just make good science. And by highlighting those qualities to the community, we could then entice the community to not only read those really high quality open science articles, but also to want to be published in that system and that ecosystem. And so that was like a model that I was developing that I thought had some legs and could potentially help to disrupt the journal mm. industry. But I was still, yeah, I mean, I was, I was feeling like it's, it's quite a long timeline still, like it's still going to take a number of years before we could generate prestige within that model and start to attract and incentivize contributions. Um, and I was also feeling like there's still a lot of risk aversion in, in academia to try something like that, because that's still quite a, it's a radically different model to what the current system is. And, and when I talk with people, I, I got the impression that, um, yeah, it was still sort of being viewed as something too renegade. And, and there are a lot of, uh, I guess, perfectionistic critiques that would come up. And my perspective has always been, can we just try stuff? Try something mm -hmm. and, and see what happens. Because as long as we're taking a step towards the goal, then we're learning and we're making progress and we can just keep taking steps. But there, there tends to be this feeling in academia of kind of, I don't know, worry about what might happen in the future. Uh, and I feel like that can be a roadblock sometimes towards making progress. Um, and so, yeah, this sort of culmination of this feeling like I, I wasn't in the right space to test these ideas um, led me to leave academia. Um, once I published my, my finished, I, once I completed my PhD, I left and um, in parallel had been, this was the time of COVID. And, and so I was observing all of this, you know, uh, misinformation going around and really mm. conflict of different perspectives between my various groups of friends, like those, my, my friends in the creative and festival space and, and my friends in the scientific space had very different ideas. And so I was feeling at the time that I, um, that we could benefit if we had safe spaces where we could connect and um, connect on like a heart level, I guess, realize that we're all, you know, the same fundamentally um, and recognize that we're not the enemy, but actually the you know bad information that we're being fed by these broken systems is the enemy in a way mm. and and to try and find spaces where we could collaborate and communicate and um, yeah have that diversity of information and ideas out on the table so that we can at least um, figure out together how we want to move forward mm. um, and so that was a idea for a new festival that we prototyped in um, November of 2022 just as we were sort of emerging from COVID mm. um, in Brisbane, in Australia. Um, and yeah, quite beautifully, like that was, it was a sort of like diverse space that people could offer. It was gift-based and people could just offer um, science talks or connection talks or well-being workshops and whatever people wanted to offer. And I realized afterwards that actually that's the perfect space to prototype because it's diverse and it's inclusive and there's mm -hmm. lots of people that aren't technically minded there mm -hmm. that we need to cater to as well if we're going to create a truly global, you know, citizen science system. Um, and it's also risk-free, well, low risk at least, you know, like there's very, it's a blank slate when you go to a, a festival and people talk about them being like, the, being as a container because you can kind of let go of what you'd normally do in, the real world and you can just explore and create and you know surrender to the space and and so it created this really safe space where we could not only um like explore contributions that we wanted to give to the community but afterwards we ran our first prototype of this model that i had been developing mm -hmm. for academia using the contributions to the conference uh, sorry to the festival mm. um yeah, and so we we collectively rated and reviewed 
<laughs> DJ sets and, you know, talks that people gave and setting up the music stage and cleaning the toilets and all of these different, like very diverse contributions we, we put into this prototype, which was a spreadsheet. And we um, gave out some gratitude tokens to say thank you for all of the contributions and collected some data and, and did some analyses and, and learned from the process. And that was really the beginning of what is now known as open heart and mind or OM for short. Wow. Okay. Nice. It sounds like, wow, a perfect blending of some of the best features that the open science community has brought to life, such as from like the journal rating you mentioned, um, the Center for Open Science has developed a thing called Top Factor, a metric for journals to assess or to rank journals based on their implementation of open science practices and um, calling, um, calling upon authors who submit to them to adhere to the open science principles and standards. But then also the collective effort that the open science um, communities um, also practice and walking the talk and talking the work kind of thing. And, and then the acknowledgement approach um, reminds me of the credit taxonomy. I don't know if you heard, well, yeah, obviously you heard of that. So where any contribution to a scientific um, accomplishment of any sorts is to be acknowledged by name uh, or of the individual organization who contributed. And by organization, it can also go down to uh, indigenous communities if they decide to be mentioned or want and can for sensitivity um, considerations mentioned by name. Um, um, so yeah, and even down to drivers who facilitate the research to be executed in the first place. Like, And that's um, not for a decision-making consortium to, um, to, to consider or to decide, but for the research community to determine who contributed significantly in their mm. measures to the success of the project. Um, yeah, that's right. I mean, we, we have the we have the power and the capacity to decide amongst ourselves what we think yeah. is valuable. And and the trick is you're creating a system where everyone can have a say and everyone is also incentivized to provide quality data. Mm. And I think that's the really tricky problem to solve. And like after that first, I, I like that you mentioned credit because I love credit as a system. I see mm. it as a kind of, I see as what we're doing as a, an attempt to be more precise because I see credit as having three levels effectively, you know, in, in any of the categories, you're either lead, co-lead or contributor. I think at least the last time I looked at it was something along those lines. Mm -hmm. And then you've got a number of categories from writing and design and you know data collection, and all of these different really important factors that go into research. Mm -hmm. And we, we prototyped a model that was similar. Our, our second version after the, after the gratitude token distribution was a, like a scoring um, process, which was um, similar to the process that I, our applications were judged by when we uh, applied for the Open Life Science Leaders Program that I, I did for, for Free Our Knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, and, and effectively, that is like a score on some number of, like some scale, like so one to three on some number of dimensions. And so that's that's another model that we prototyped. And... It, it works well for some use cases, but the problem that we found is that it's not it's not as inclusive as I wanted the model to be. So I, I wanted a model that could incorporate any type of contribution and, and the community could effectively calculate the relative value of that contribution. And mm -hmm. the problem with a sort of rubric style model um, like credit is, is that you need to define those levels. So you need to really have a definition of what is a lead and what is a co-lead and what is a contributor for mm -hmm. each of those categories. And when you're talking about really diverse categories, like beyond just publishing a paper, yeah. it it gets really unwieldy because you need to write a new rubric for every single type of contribution. And And so we actually, we didn't get far into the prototyping of that before we realized this just wasn't tenable. Like we just couldn't use this for the festival case and if we couldn't use it for the festival case then diverse co communities couldn't adopt our model mm. and that's really important to make sure that this is inclusive and 
and accessible. So, um, so yeah, like that eventually led to the, I, I think the breakthrough idea, which I think is the real key innovation of the model that we're pursuing now. Um, and it was motivated by, um, my studies, actually, my, in my PhD, I did these studies that were, um, a two alternative force choice paradigm. So what, what I mean by that, I was exploring awareness of objects. And so I would present people these flickering patches, um, two patches, and I would ask them to tell me which of the patch contained the signal hidden mm -hmm. in the noise. And what we know is that when you force people to make these choices, even though they not, might not feel that something's, you know, actually present, they are better than chance. So there is a subconscious, you know, recognition that something's going on there. And so you can, what that means is you can tease out people's subconscious preferences and biases, even when they're not sure, you know, which they would actually want to pick, want to pick. Interesting. Um, and, and the other thing it does is it makes it a really simple paradigm for people. So, you know, choosing one of two things is really, really easy. Um, anyone can do that task. And in the context of a festival, you don't need to know all of the interconnected moving parts about you know, who did what and what all of the contributions were. You can just literally just ask someone, what do you think is more X? Like, what do you, what are you more grateful for this DJ set or the person that cleaned the toilets for four hours? And although that seems like a really, you know, awkward, strange thing to compare, <laughs> like very diverse categories, it is still and on actually... your agencies at the moment, but yeah, <laughs> it's a That's matter right. of personal moment. preference. <laughs> Absolutely. It might change depending on what time of the day you ask someone, but, <laughs> but it, but it does, it, it is doable in contrast to the first model, which was, you know, hand out tokens to all of these 57 contributions that we've identified. Well, that takes a very long time mm. to do properly. And it also takes like a really high level of expertise to, to do it fairly, because really th there was only a few people like including myself that understood all of the moving parts of that festival and so could actually do that task fairly and and I think there's a parallel there to academia because you know the current review process is very expert based and I think that has value of course like we need to hear from the experts but it's also really valuable to hear from everyone and mm -hmm. to make sure that that process is inclusive and and everyone has a chance to have their say um sure. from from every level to you know the absolute novice to all the way up to the expert and isn't that um, also that brings me back to the question of why do we do research in the first place? And your experiment um, or piloting exercise uh, brings me yeah back to that very question. And what's your what's your take on to what extent should the target audience of of why we do the research in the first place, which is citizens at large? Um, reserving societies or the environment or the planet per se, but usually humans. I think Western research is mostly human directed, um, so self serving ultimately. But, um, and then the whole open access movement argued along the lines of most of the research is publicly funded, so the public has a determined right to access the information that's coming out of it. But now, so acknowledging, but also acknowledging the contributions towards research, even though by by and also by non-academics, and that's I think that's a like never-ending discussion that citizen scientists continue to have. So yeah, this is about rethinking academia to me, and you know one of the tenets of open science is citizen science that everyone should and and could be able to be involved and. These ivory towers have to have to be torn down in many ways because they're preventing the vast population of the world from being involved in academia. And what I was imagining was what I've been working towards is a system where anyone in the world could contribute something meaningful and the community could collectively decide, is that valuable? And mm. we could do that without institutions telling us what we think should think is valuable we can just collectively decide amongst ourselves yeah we think this is valuable um, but who said we who's the community to make that decision and what's the mechanism to vote for it again i mean i like the idea of not doing any research just because we can 
and that's the excuse of some researchers doing some weird things to to the just because for the sake of research i think we're beyond that uh aspect of knowledge gain we have actual issues to solve and just because we can we shouldn't do all kinds of creepy things that people yeah can. <laughs> yeah i so, i agree i think i think a lot of money is wasted in the re research ecosystem just because we can and i saw this in neuroscience there's a lot of like really low powered studies being done you know like n of 20 and and 40 and that sort of thing and the the level of reliability that you get out of that is just it's not really worth doing that level of study, but it's driven by this impact-based significance paradigm. Mm. And much, much better would be if we could re reward those, you know, big science teams that are replicating and producing really valuable um, knowledge gain in, mm. in combining those small studies together. And that's what I meant before, like when I, I said that the system doesn't reward collaboration, it's, it's rewarding these small teams to do their own thing of you know 20 participants at a time and publish that result and you know get their high impact paper out of it but actually we should rather than having five of those compete and only one of them getting published we should be rewarding those five to work together and create a higher power study with 100 people or a thousand mm -hmm. or ten thousand people and we should be rewarding that team rather than you know the having the five compete yeah, um, and actually and make so, research results replicable across the world, where otherwise we only have like small snippets of something, lightning moments, light bulb moments. Yeah, and mm. so before you asked, like you know, who is who is doing the deciding of what's valuable? Well, the idea of creating a universal model is that the community can self form. So this model that we've come up with is so um, simple but yet flexible that I believe literally any community on the world, not just in academia, like in arts, in the environment could adopt it if they wanted to, and they could adapt it to suit their own values and the types of contributions that they are um, wanting to review and recognize and reward. Um, and they could form their own community that, you know, self validates when within themselves, what mm -hmm. they think is valuable. And the beautiful thing about that is it, they can decide what's valuable and and if that's useful to them, it's useful to them and they'll continue to use yeah. using the system. But if what they find is valuable is also useful to another community, yeah. then those com two communities could begin to collaborate and coordinate because they would now be using the same fundamental framework. So I think of this like a language that, that communities could use to express gratitude or express other qualities that they want to represent within mm -hmm. the framework. Um, and with that language, it's digitally encoded, it's it's written into the code base, and they could form a new uh, cross-disciplinary um, layer with which they can communicate value. And when you look at the current situation, like you look at modern society, and we've built these, you know, ivory towers, as you say, um, in multiple sectors, and none of those sectors can communicate. We've got education, science, law, um, you know, politics, and all of these different sectors in society have created their own set of codes, their own language, their own set of behaviors, norms, customs. And when you look at how these different towers try to interact, you, you see that these really crazy resonance effects where, you know, the, the science might be completely settled within the scientific community, but then when it tries to transfer across to the political sphere and get communicated to the broader public through the media, mm. you get these crazy resonance effects where it's it's still seen as a debate and you know the the broader com community aren't getting access to that um information because it's it is an ivory tower and it is communicated through communicated through these restricted venues where people can't um get to the bottom of the information and they can't investigate um freely and i i believe in human curiosity i believe that we're all scientists in one way or another, whether the system wants to let us be them or not. And the vast majority of people are curious and do want to understand what's true and are capable of sifting through information. Or if at the very least we provide them with metrics that show them what is valuable information and, and also who are, who are the people to be trusted, who are the experts, then they can make up their own mind based on that information. And 
Mm. I'm not saying that, you know, some people won't go down rabbit warrens and, and still, you know, start believing conspiracy theories, but at least the information would be available. It would be on the table and people could begin to take ownership of, you know, their own information sources and, and filter it in the way that makes sense for them. And yeah, no. I like the idea of that. I mean, I can literally see it in front of me and that's the, that's why I was kind of trying to, um, this was where, where I was heading, where it's like any citizen can also find co-ownership in the research that's being done because they see mm. the value that it provides to societies and to certain aspects of society, such societal well-being and welfare and yeah, challenge resolution and mitigation. Um, or even knowledge gain and knowledge um, preservation where there's not much happening still today for certain cultures of this planet. Yeah, so, well, that sounds all exciting. <laughs> Thanks for playing <laughs> that with us. So what is the, what are the next two, three steps? Like what, what's, what's awaiting us and where can people engage with you and the project? Um, thank you for asking. <laughs> um, next steps. Well, yeah, so through this process, it's, it's been, yeah, like I said, a long two years and we've been prototyping and we've now collected We'll settle on this model that I believe is is the one that um, could be universal and and spread. But we've also collected some prototype data, so we've got a, a complete data set that shows how the model works for the festival community. Um, I presented this at a at the Amos conference in November, and and out of that we've now spurned a new collaboration. So we're now using the same model to rate and review contributions to the conference itself. No. Um, and we've also got like a number of projects within our open heart and mind organization that are, are prototyping and, and exploring different aspects of the model. Mm. Um, but I just uh, am currently on the back of a, a tour through America and we presented at a, another festival in Texas and we've now started a collaboration with those, with that community as well. So like the way I see this moving forward is we're still at the prototyping stage, but looking for communities that are interested in this idea and wanting to explore the model, because the more we can, you know, demonstrate the different use cases, then the more we can show the universality of this, um, this system, this framework, um, and begin to build that network where different communities can start to communicate value, like I was saying before. Um, and so, and really the, yeah, the, Big next step is funding. So um, now that we have this data set, I'm now kind of re-emerging from my turtle shell and um, <laughs> um, reconnecting with good souls like yourself. Um, mm. Because I'm, I've I've learned a lot personally. It's been a big journey of growth the last two years, and we've been you know building a community, and that's been a really new area for me. Um, we've also merged with a charity, so um, we're now a registered chari charity in Australia where we can accept donations. Um, but yeah, with the the data, the idea was always once we had some data to come back to academia and and start sharing it and and seeing what people think of the model and and exploring different use cases from every level of academia. Um, and so this can be as simple as you know a journal club meeting um, to as high level as you know public publishing papers and rating and reviewing each other's papers and that sort of thing. Um, and so the what I'm thinking for me next steps is to yeah get funding but also particularly i'm focusing towards looking for fellowships because i'm feeling like i have had my had my head a little too much in the turtle shell the last two years and i haven't really maintained the the network and connection that i've i i was building with free our knowledge um and also just feel like i'm still out of my depth in so many departments in this um in this project and so i'm seeking mentoring and um wanting to connect with like-minded souls again mm. um and it and, sounds yeah, so like I, it was a necessary step to 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 dive deep and and kind of find a safe space but also isolated space for some time with just a few selected people to yeah just to 
to play around and develop the ideas and the concepts and to where you are now and you're not starting again from scratch you're building up on what you've built with a free of knowledge and the connections are all still here so that's good yes it's and it's really exciting all, to see that in yeah. most yeah yeah it's exciting to see that in the in the time i've had my attention focused elsewhere that there's there's has been that sort of institutional shift like you say and that there mm -hmm. has been a lot of movement in this direction everything from unesco to you know the white house declaring last year as the year of mm -hmm. open science and so it, it is feeling like um there's that sort of top down and bottom up momentum now uh, and I think that was a really big benefit of COVID as well, is that it showed people the power of open science and the necessity for um, making information available to everyone. Mm. Um, so, yeah, it's feeling like a really exciting time to be in this space and, and to be sort of re-emerging into the academic yeah. sphere. Um, and, yeah, I should say as well, short term, actually something I'm really excited about is I'm going to be bringing the AMOS data to SIPS conference, which is in Kenya in hey. africa <laughs> that's so nice yeah. i mentioned that before before this um recording we're having now and well that's cool but can you just explain the acronym is a is a like an annual conference for the psychology um community sub stands for what was it again yes it's the society for the improvement of psychological science mm -hmm. and it was i see it as really like the first conference that um has now sprouted different versions. Like there's there's various sort of open science and meta science conferences now, but it, it really started with SIPS in the field of psychology. Mm. Um, and it's a really, it's just such an exciting conference because it's kind of like it adopts the open source unconference model where it's not so much about, like they do have keynotes, but it's really the focus is on collaboration and, you know, proposing new ideas and developing them on the fly. And so they tend to have, you know, open slots where you can just propose a hackathon and and jump in with like-minded people and get cracking on a problem. And it's really generative, um, you know, as most of open science is. Yeah, um, I just remembered who I should definitely put in touch with when it comes to Kenya, who are based there, and also from the psychology ecosystem. So you'll get a list of names. <laughs> Great. <laughs> <laughs> and it sounds like there's a, like SIPS is being held in collaboration with, um, I'm not going to get the name right. We can put it in the show notes. Um, I think Butara Institute or something like that. That's like a um, behavioral change institute in Kenya. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm really excited about like learning more about that and and hearing about what they're doing on the ground and, and seeing if what we're doing could be useful to an organization like that. Because yeah, I believe I believe what we're creating is yeah. that's the target market. You know, the the disempowered nations around the world that have all the value to be adding to science but aren't allowed into the game well we're, we're creating a new game that anyone can play and um yeah i'll be looking for interested people to to chat with and, and potentially collaborate with over there cool thank you so much for doing all that work and i know it's it's kind of um an out of necessity or it's because you you're very much embody that role of initiating initiatives like or initiating campaigns really of of a large scale and momentum to probably change paradigms but sophisticatedly so like with actual hardwired information as a baseline so it's not out of the blue but um yeah it's basically like how do we say like i i just, I keep having this German expression in mind, but sophisticated, well-researched initiatives to to shift the paradigm properly. And I'm um, really happy that we're reconnecting now and very excited for the next few weeks and months and years of co-creation, collaboration, and you know, rejoining once every um, once every so often to to touch base and to see how we overlap and can join efforts to accomplish those ambitions. One step oh, at a time. Thank you, Jay. That's yeah, one step. That's it. <laughs> thank you. That's really lovely to hear. And I likewise have always appreciated your work in the open science space. And I think, 
you know, we need, we need work at all levels. You know, we, we need the fundamental stuff and then we need the communicating to the broader audience. And, and so really appreciate all of your work over the years and that you could invite me onto this podcast and uh, yeah, share what we're up to. Yeah, and then um, it's likely that we find ourselves here again after some time to report on the progress made since. And so, yeah, until then, um, all the best and speak soon in other arenas as well. I look forward to it. Thanks, Jay. All the best to you too. Thanks for joining us to listen to this episode. Do let us know what you think. You can email us or connect with us on our social media channels, which you can find on our website at accesstoperspectives.org. Email us at info at accesstoperspectives.org or book a call to explore how we can support you with your research planning, management and publishing. Welcome you again soon for our next episode. Until then, have a great time.